Will low-code, no-code tools and automation lead to fewer developer jobs? My guest today doesn't think so, and he'll tell us why on this episode of Dynamic Developer. I'm your host, Bill Detweiler, and I'm joined by Malcolm Ross, VP of Product Strategy and Deputy CTO at Appian. Malcolm, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for the time, Bill. Before we get started uh, talking about um, automation and low-code and no-code citizen developers and the effect that that's having on the software development industry as a whole, um, for those who don't know Appian, uh, give them a little rundown on what Appian is, uh, what it does, and what you do uh, there. Sure. Appian is a uh, low-code development platform, and we specialize, of course, in automation, workflow, RPA, those other areas. So if you think about what that means is it's a new paradigm for building applications using more visual, declarative, drag-and-drop tools to rapidly deliver solutions that customers are expecting, of course, in a cloud-native modern architecture as well. Uh, I've been with Appian for over 16 and a half years now, so i uh, several roles, but my current roles, I lead product strategy, uh, which is the long-term roadmap direction of the company, but in several roles as far as leading product management, product marketing, other aspects of the company as well. And been in the automation space myself before Appian for about 22 years now. So a lot of experience just in enterprise software and building kind of workflow BPM processes for a variety of companies over uh, several decades now. I think that's a great segue into my first question because you have so much experience in automation. And, you know, one of the fears when that software developers, uh, engineers, full stack developers um, have when it comes to low code and no code tools is this, um, is that it could be, I guess, uh, limiting their career prospects, right? You know, it could be by making it easier for more folks to develop enterprise software without sort of the fundamental sort of traditional sort of software engineer and training background. Um, d- does it make them less needed, right? Are there going to be less developer jobs because now you don't need a developer to, to build software? So, you know, Pulling on your experience in automation from the past and now translating that into kind of an automation per se, but actually just reducing the barrier to entry to creating enterprise software. Um, what, what do you say to those concerns? How, how do you uh, address them? Now, really, there's so many ways to kind of unpack that. And, you know, I'm one of those myself. I got my degree in computer science and information science, you know, a few decades ago uh, and consider myself a developer. But with that regard, you got to, it's a look at the global backlog of digital needs. It's, it's humongous. The reality is there's not enough people to satisfy the demand to digitize all these businesses out there. Uh, and things like the global pandemic have just accelerated that need as we need to work more at a distance, as retail stores need to do online shopping and digital pickup more. The demand is just simply not stopping. It's growing and growing. So there's no fear as far as you know software developers losing jobs because the jobs we can't you know speaking from a software company we can't hire enough people with professional software development experience. Low code tools though are a direct response to kind of this trend of what we've seen over the past ten years of the need for agile development, agile growth. So. As we saw, like in the mid 2000s, there was a big shift from, say, waterfall development to agile development and doing rapid one week, two week sprint cycles and showing results quickly and having more agile development methodologies that adapt to business change. While the methodologies of how you built software change, the tools themselves did not uh, and didn't really allow people to build quickly and uh, with agility because of the high code experience, because of the numerous tools required, you think about kind of a, a Java developer, right? If I'm building in Java, fine. It's like I'm, I'm, I've am I'm spent time learning that high code experience, learn how to build all these interfaces. But Java is just oftentimes a service layer. 
If I want to say build unit tests on it, I need to use JUnit. If I want to start to merge that into a CI CD architecture, I need to learn GitHub, Ant Scripts. Uh, I need to learn Jenkins or Bamboo. If I need to build integration or user experience testing, I need to learn Selenium. Oftentimes I wanna build that UI layer, I need to learn Angular or React or other languages. So it's immensely complex to be a full stack developer and to build all these elements, you have to learn a lot of tools. Uh, a lot of tools, not just to build what you want, but also to get it through an agile CI CD pipeline. Uh, and that's complex and it's difficult to train people and it's also difficult to do it right. Low code tools really aren't about kind of displacing developers. It's about facilitating that process more elegantly. When you think about low code, you often just think about that composition layer. So the composition, like how do I declare what I want, you know, from coding to drag and drop? Well, anyone who's familiar with the SDLC knows that that's probably just 20, 30% of the entire software development process. There's testing development, there's, you know, pushing things through, there's branching, there's diffing, there's merging, there's deployment cycles, there's testing. All these things need to come together to do, produce high, uh, high quality software. Low code tools, or at least the ones like Appian, address the full life cycle. So it's not just about declarative tooling, making it easier for you know, non-coders to, to, uh, to build stuff, but it's also about facilitating the entire agile life cycle to build things quickly and deploy them quickly and iterate quickly and change quickly as well. Yeah, so there, I mean, that, that's the sentiment that I've heard from lots of people is there's so much work out there that we're not running out of work for full stack uh, developers anytime soon. This really is about broadening that base. Um, and I know one of the ways uh, companies broaden that base is through citizen developer programs. Um, talk a little bit about those, you know, the, the, how, you, how organizations can use these low code tools for that percentage of the process that you just talked about and bring more people within their organization into that process. Yeah, that's multiple layers too, because expanding the number of people who can participate in application development is naturally going to be beneficial. And you do that by both hiring more professional developers as well as simplifying the process of development, which is what the low code side, which then gets into citizen developers and who is a developer, who is non-developer. Uh, so when you think about most citizen developers, we often have these already. You know, we've actually had these citizen developers for 20, 30 years now, ever since the Microsoft Office suite came out and allowed you to write macros in Excel, right? We've had citizen developers and they built things in the Office suite. You know, I, I myself spent time in the 90s building Fox Pro and Microsoft Access databases in the business line for mortgage companies. Uh, and I was a citizen developer. I wasn't an official IT, but I was building things that were used for daily operations for, in that case, mortgage rates, uh, uh, notifications to lenders. Uh, so we've had this realm of citizen developers for a long time. And the, the spiral of Microsoft Access databases and Excel, complex Excel spreadsheets has just been growing and growing. So loco tools do give you an opportunity to expand both what system developers can create beyond just the realm of the office suite. So they can now create mobile applications, robotic process automations, workflows, uh, web applications. They can expand more, but as well, a low code tool like Appian gives you more centralized control of it. Rather than sitting on everyone's client desktop and people doing whatever, you can have a governance lifecycle on top of it. I can still have IT run a center of excellence to manage the center of ex uh, this, the citizen developers. I can enforce policies, consistency, so I can have a more managed approach. I can empower people, citizen developers, as well as make sure I'm still maintaining my information security and development best practices as well. So it, it's the best of both worlds. One of the other things that low code tools also focus on is that business IT collaboration. So you have pure citizen developers who you just let go, but then you also need a realm of where I align business and IT more closely. And this often is a journey as we evolve from waterfall to agile. One of the biggest challenges of that is getting the business to engage. Uh, business users have been kind of uh, spoiled or used to waterfall where they just tell you my requirements, you know, upfront, and then say, I'll see you in four to six months when you finish my magical application without talking to you on a regular basis. And we, of course, know that doesn't work. And the, the, the key to agile is really 
having that regular communication with the business where I demonstrate as a developer what I've built, validate uh, with the business constituents uh, that this is what they want, and then plan and change the backlog to meet the next set of criteria. So it's that constant communication. Though code tools, since we're providing a mechanism that the business can understand better. So instead of looking at code of a logic, maybe they have a specific like tax calculation rule. Instead of looking at the tax calculation in Java code and say, hey, is this what you want? They're not really understanding what they're looking at. You can show them a decision table. You can show them a process flow or decision tree. You can show them something visual that the business users understand better. So a big part of what low code tools is, is still empowering IT as well to build applications, but have a development framework which bridges that communication cap with a business so that they can look at your work and understand it and also validate it and participate better in the agile development process. So it's both fronts. It's, it's purely, low code is not purely a system development tool. It's, it's actually more commonly adopted by professional IT and the benefit is actually the business IT collaboration of having that common uh, language framework. Yeah, I think it's really, th that's interesting. And I like the Microsoft um, Access uh, Fox Pro kind of analogy there. I remember, you know, doing those same kind of things back in the 90s too. And that that's the way I sort of liken uh, the low code and the no code tools to sort of the same rise that you saw with business productivity suites. Uh, during the, the during the 90s and the 2000s, right? You know, it made even things like word processing and Excel spreadsheets didn't le suddenly mean we don't need CPAs and we don't need people to use those tools, but it gave more people access uh, to those tools, which allowed businesses uh, to be more produ productive uh, and to produce uh, whatever, you know, whatever they were using to produce, whatever they're producing uh, in a better way to broaden that base. And I'd like to key on something you just said there, which is the interaction between the business and between IT, because you were talking about how there needs to be, as part of the Agile process, this back and forth. How do companies do that successfully that maybe haven't done that in the past? Like, you know, I, I'm not sure. Most folks that I talk to are have moved to Agile development process. Um, and as part of that, they're involving product managers or they're trying to get the, the business constituents more involved in the process. But that can be a little tricky, as you said, for companies that maybe have been spoiled or they don't have that as part of their culture. H how have you found uh, companies do that successfully? Yeah, it's it's evolutionary because what you're getting at no, is no longer a technology problem. It's a cultural challenge inside organizations. And over the past several decades, we've grown in thinking like, here's business, here's IT, and they are distinctly different business units. And when you set these artificial barriers of the departmental structures between business and IT, it, it creates almost a natural conflict as well. Uh, I've been in meetings uh, where business and IT could not literally sit in the same conference room together because the hostility, you know, IT would think that, you know, business doesn't understand the complexities of managing the arch architectures and keeping up to date. Business is saying IT is not responsive enough. They're not meeting my needs. And there's a hostility there. So what, what needs to happen is really kind of a breakdown. If you look at the, the modern companies that are succeeding today, you know, the Ubers, the Lyfts, Facebooks, things like that, th there almost is no business in IT. Uh, they're, they're almost one integrated uh, company. Uh, and IT is an essential part, or the act of software development is an essential part of how their business works. So that's probably the first thing is starting to break down those lines and mo moving these merge teams together, that they have a shared common goal uh, and that they're investing. Uh, the business is thinking about software development as their business, as how they go to market. Uh, and that's a cultural breakdown of these hierarchical structures and bring them together. And then IT, like centralized IT's role then is not necessarily doing every project because you have people sitting with the business doing the projects, but really establishing the standards of the organization. Things like security information or information security rather, um, making sure that the way information is handled is secure. Uh, things like user experience, having established user experience model for all applications. Things like SOA architectures that you have standards for which I'm going to expose information APIs so that can be easily reused across the enterprise. That's kind of shifting where, you know, pure IT's role is not 
do the individual project delivery, but overseeing IT strategy across the entire company while merging IT with the business functions more, more directly as well. Uh, so that's not easily done, especially kind of you're breaking down oftentimes decades of cultural hierarchies that have been established uh, in trying to merge these business units together. You know, so if you're speaking to someone on the IT side in the development side, so if you're talking to a dev stack, if you're talking to senior developers, you're talking to um, team leads and to department heads, what would be your advice for them to get started in trying to break down some of those barriers? So if, I, if I'm coming at this from that side of the table, what type of outreach or what type of processes do I need to put in place both for my team and myself to maintain sort of those, to shift our role in the process to oversight and to encourage uh, the lines of business to kind of take on some of that responsibility themselves, but also do so in a way that meets guidance and policy requirements like, like you talked about. Just uh, because I, I think a lot of people want to do that. And I think a lot of companies are like, oh, th this sounds really good. And so we know kind of where to start. But if you're coming at this and you're a, uh, you know, a team lead, if you're the director of an engineer, you know, senior director of engineering at a company and you're sitting here going, OK, well, how do I sort of move the ball, you know, yeah. the first step? What are the first steps that I need to take in kind of this process? Is it going to executive leadership? Is it trying to make sort of grassroots inroads with the head of finance or the head of HR to say, you know what? What would be really good is if you had this person, you know, on your team, or let me identify the people on your team who can help us use these low code and no code tools. And then, you know, how do you get started? Obviously, everyone's different in where they are in their journey. Some companies are very modern. Some companies have legacy to deal with. Uh, I've, I've worked with some companies like major uh, utility uh, water companies. And, you know, some other like big trucking companies and what I recommend to them where you have these like oftentimes not just decades, but century or more of legacy of interactions uh, is IT needs to get out of the cube, right? They need to get out of the office uh, in the water, water utilities company, for example, I said, well, if, if you're trying to build mobile solutions for someone who's in the field, uh, IT, you should take the guy out of the cube or the gal put them in the suit, have them go into the sewer pipes and the water pipes and live the experience of the business users. Uh, there's that respect that needs to be built. You know, another example, Appian's built several contact center solutions for organizations. And one of the things that when we were building contact center solutions is I was shipping my engineers to contact centers in like remote areas of Kentucky and Salt Lake City and saying, I want you to sit in that contact center and work the phone for three days. Uh, you want to handle calls, you want to live their experience. And that that doesn't just give the IT person a, a perspective of what the job is really like for what you're building solutions for, but it also builds the respect with the business. You know, the business sees the IT person as, yeah, they're helping me do my job. They're here in the seat next to me. They're here in the sewer pipe with me cleaning out the gunk. And they're looking at what my job does. Uh, oftentimes, again, in some of these legacy industries and in like utilities and energy and trucking, uh, you have people who have been doing that job for decades itself as far as maintaining uh, utilities. And there's a level of respect that has to be established. And the business needs to see IT as a participant in kind of what the mission of this corporation is. Uh, so that's part of it, the cultural side. Uh, and then once you establish that respect, like, hey, I, yeah, I'm part of this business. I'm not just this outside IT organization. I'm part of you to help drive new solutions. Then it's also establishing COE tools. But from what a IT needs to do is look, look seriously at their stacks. And oftentimes you, you get in this technical debt trap, right, where you love to build new solutions, but I spend 80% of my time just maintaining yesterday's applications. And I go and get a small sliver of my time actually building new solutions, which is often the trap that IT falls into is you're just optimizing you know, memory, you're making sure CPUs stay or the computers stay online, you're doing you know, patches to application web servers, you're just doing things that the business doesn't appreciate and it's just janitorial work of IT. Uh, you need to 
look at the stack, identify all the things that you're doing janitorial work for, just keeping the lights on and find solutions that ex extricate yourself from doing that work. You know, cloud-based low code solutions are exactly that, you know, where we automatically upgrade, we automatically patch, we automatically secure, we maintain the architecture for you so you can focus on innovation, which is another benefit of low code tools is to refocus the attention of the people who use these low code development tools away from just maintenance and back onto innovation as far as the total amount of time you spend. Uh, and then as you look at the architecture, then starting to establish that COE as well. You know, once you have that credibility with business, then I can start to dictate. It's like, no, this is the way you need to handle information. You know, there's, there's GDPR today. There's serious ransomware attacks going on. We need to protect this company against these IT threats. That's COE's, uh, the IT central uh, center of excellence's job. We need to establish standards of IT and how everything's going to get done. Uh, so it's, it's a multi-layered process. And we think about the things that need to go on, but uh, starting with that first, the business IT respect collaboration is probably the most important area. Yeah, I, I love that sentiment, and, I, and I'll I'll, um, I'll give the audience you a little information. A full disclosure: I started my IT career. Um, uh, my first enterprise job was in a public utility, um, and for new folks that would come in, that would say, "Well, why are these systems failing? Or why are these? What's this hardware failing?" We'd say, "Yeah, that's because you've never been to a coal-fired power plant." <laughs> you know, um, in Kentucky for folks that uh, can't tell from my accent. Uh, but, you know, once you got out there and you saw some of the environments that the uh, lines of business were operating in, then you understood their challenges. And, and, and I will agree with you 100%. Um, it provided uh, mutual respect and kind of mutual understanding because IT and the networking folks and the engineering folks understood what people were working with on a day-to-day -day basis and vice versa. They, you know, the lines of business folks said, oh, well, you actually took the time to come out here. So I wholeheartedly agree on that. Well, uh, Malcolm, you know, I'd like to sort of wrap things up because I, I think you, th this also leads to a really important point um, and something that I've heard uh, many folks mention, which is bringing those software development process closer to the lines of business, right? So whether it's both IT going down and being involved and meeting with, uh, you know, p walking in the shoes of the business, but it also allows those lines of business through citizen developer programs to have folks who are already intimately kind of familiar with their, um, with their situation participate in that development process. So... Yeah. For, for companies that have done that successfully, you know, that, that pushing, I don't want to say pushing software development down, but it's just bringing software and application development closer to, to the business. Are there any recommendations that you have not in process or you've already talked about um, for ways to, to, to do that? I, I guess to, um, to have the right people within the lines of business, sort of use these low code, no code tools so that they can participate in the software development process. Yeah, it's uh, again, uh, uh, I think a lot of us lived through this with Microsoft SharePoint as well, when uh, the, the promise of SharePoint was, hey, I'm gonna have a, a portal environment that's gonna let everyone kind of share their information. If you could get it to run and it wasn't slower than everything in the world, so. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a whole slide I talk about the history of SharePoint where I, I equate it to going to Michael's and buying the best paint set, right? And you just imagine that if I, if I buy the best paint set and I give it to my children, they're gonna produce like Van Gogh's and Picasso's and beautiful works of art. And then the next slide I have is a child covered in paint, right? <laughs> so uh, with great power comes great responsibility as Spider-Man's uncle says. Uh, but that's the challenge with the low code tools as well. Yes, citizen developers can participate in the application development process. Don't end up with a child covered in paint. You know, you, you still need to be an active participant in the standards practices of how software is built and that center of excellence is very important. So it needs to be metered, it needs to be controlled, it needs to be measured, uh, while also it needs to be empowered. Uh, you need to empower the business to satisfy themselves more quickly while often having times that regulatory authority kind of managing as well. So that's a really tough balance, you know, to do. How do you give people freedom while also still maintaining control? Uh, in that sense. 
Uh, and again, low code tools are pretty much the core of that. It's going to give you the mechanism to do it. It's also, as I mentioned before, going to give you the mechanism to also not just paint yourself into a technical debt corner. As people uh, do these things, they're, they're going to build up technical debt because they're going to build applications that you rely upon and then need to be maintained. And uh, cloud-based low-code tools, again, they focus on automatic upgrades, automatic security. There might already be like FedRAMP certified, PCI certified, HIPAA certified. So you get this architecture that's going to be it's protecting you a bit from technical debt, but uh, you know it's the human elements, the hard part. You know, managing those expectations, meter, giving people freedom to do development with a tool while also having a, a SDLC that controls how things are getting into production and measured over the long term. Yeah, well, I I think that's a, a great place to end it because I think that is. Um, you know, that is the challenge, right? Setting up those guardrails, setting up those bumpers, both technically and on a, on the human perspective. And, and it's a, you know, it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge because I think in the end, it gets you to a place where, you know, you can be more agile, where you can, where companies can bring software to market and respond to business needs more quickly, which as we've seen in the last year, uh, with the COVID pandemic and people rushing and accelerating their digital transformation plans is really critical um, to survival, uh, especially when you have a dramatic change in the business environment. Um, so Malcolm, again, thank you for taking the time uh, to talk with us. I really appreciate it and hope you'll come back. Cool. Thanks, Bill. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to all our viewers and listeners for joining us. You can listen to more episodes of Dynamic Developer on your favorite podcast platform or watch a video of each episode as well as read a transcript at Tech Republic. Thank you.